And I started wondering an awful lot about how you would date a vampire. And this led to one of my favorite chapters in the book, which is the one where Diana invites Matthew over for dinner. And has to figure out, though he has told her that he's omnivorous, that this is probably not the case. So she's gone shopping and she's thought it through, as a good historian would, and thought, well, they must be locavores. They probably have a raw foods diet. Then she called the zoology department and asked them what wolves ate, thinking that was probably pretty close. And then she made him a dinner. And they sit down to it, and Matthew is tucking into some salmon, much to Diana's surprise. And it leads them to a conversation about the, the stories people tell about them and uh, some insights into what it is to be human. So I'm going to finish off with, with this passage from the book. So Matthew's eating his salmon, and Diana just can't stand it anymore. Can you really eat this, I blurted out. He laughed. Yes, I happen to like smoked salmon. But you don't eat everything, I insisted, turning my attention back to my plate. No, he admitted, but I can manage a few bites of most food. It doesn't taste like much to me, though, unless it's raw. That's odd, considering that vampires have perfect senses, I said. I think that all food would taste wonderful. He picked up his wine glass and looked into the pale golden liquid. Wine tastes wonderful. Food tastes wrong to a vampire once it's been cooked to death. I reviewed the menu with enormous relief. If food doesn't taste good, why do you keep inviting me out to eat, I asked. Matthew's eyes flicked over my cheeks, my eyes, and lingered on my mouth. It's easier to be around you when you're eating. The smell of cooked food nauseates me. <laughs> I blinked at him, still confused. As long as I'm nauseated, I'm not hungry, Matthew said, his voice exasperated. Oh, the pieces clicked together. I already knew he liked the way I smelled. Apparently, that made him hungry. Oh, I flushed. I thought you knew that about vampires, he said more gently, and that's why you invited me for dinner. I shook my head, tucking another bundle of salmon together. I probably know less about vampires than most humans do, and the little my Aunt Sarah told me has to be treated as highly suspect, given her prejudices. She was quite clear, for instance, on your diet. She said vampires will consume only blood because it's all you need to survive. But that isn't true, is it? Matthew's eye just narrowed, and his tone was suddenly frosty. No, you need water to survive. Is that all you drink? Should I not be talking about this, I asked. My questions were making him angry. You can't help being curious, I suppose, Matthew replied after considering my question for a long moment. I drink wine and can eat food, preferably uncooked food or food that's cold so that it doesn't smell. But the food and wine don't nourish you, I guessed. You feed on blood, all kinds of blood. He flinched. And you don't have to wait outside until I invite you into my house. What else do I have wrong about vampires? Matthew's face adopted an expression of long-suffering patience. He sat back in the chair, taking the wine glass with him. Most of what you know about me, about vampires, was dreamed up by humans. These legends made it possible for humans to live around us. Creatures frighten them, and I'm not talking solely about vampires. Black hats, bats, brooms, I said. It was the unholy trinity of witchcraft lore which burst into spectacular, ridiculous life every year on Halloween. Exactly, Matthew nodded. Somewhere in each of these stories, there's a nugget of truth, something that frightened humans and helped them deny we were real. The strongest distinguishing characteristic of humans is their power of denial. I have strength in long life. You have supernatural abilities. Demons have awe-inspiring creativity. Humans can convince themselves up is down and black is white. It's their special gift. <laughs> What's the truth in this story about vampires not being allowed inside without an invitation? Having pressed him on his diet, I focused on the entrance protocols instead. <laughs> Humans are with us all the time, he said. They just refuse to acknowledge our existence because we don't make sense in their limited world. Once they allow us in, see us, who for, see us for who we really are, 
then we're in to stay, just as someone you've invited into your home can be hard to get rid of. They can't ignore us anymore. So it's like the stories of sunlight, I said slowly. It's not that you can't be in sunlight, but when you are, it's harder for humans to ignore you. Rather than admit that you're walking among them, humans tell themselves you can't survive the light. Matthew nodded again. They managed to ignore us anyway, of course. We can't stay indoors until after dark. But we make more sense to humans after twilight, and that goes for you too. You should see the looks when you walk into a room or down the street. I thought about my ordinary appearance and glanced at him doubtfully. Matthew chuckled. You don't believe me, I know, but it's true. When humans see a creature in broad daylight, it makes them uneasy. We're too much for them. Too tall, too strong, too creative, too powerful, too different. They try very hard to push our square pegs into their round holes all day long. At night, it's a bit easier to dismiss us as merely odd.